now my distinct pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Ricardo Levens Morales. Ricardo is an artist and social justice activist. His art studio in Minneapolis is bannered with the phrase art for social justice. Some of his work is for sale at this conference. You can also see and purchase his work online at his website, rlmartstudio.com. Now, I first heard Ricardo speak on this stage last year as he led a workshop entitled Organizing Dilemmas on the Road to Freedom. I was delighted when Ricardo was asked to be a keynoter this year so more could hear some of what he has to share. Ricardo has a long history as an organizer and disruptor of racism. If you haven't already, I invite you to read Ricardo's bio printed in your program. But for now, let me accent a couple of things you may not find in the bio, but are key in his own journey as a disruptor of white supremacy, colonialism, and racism. In a blog on his website, Ricardo tells the story of how a loose-knit coalition of groups and individuals of which he was a part disrupted the 500-year planned celebration of Columbus coming to America, leading to the collapse of events designed to support the false colonial myth about the discovery of America. This disruption led to the re-evaluation of one of our nation's racist foundational myths and resulted in new educational materials in our schools. Coalition building is central for Ricardo in this work of disrupting racism. Also central to Ricardo's work is narrative, storytelling, and relationship building. You will notice his art does all of these things. His work draws us into story, taking us beyond facts and abstractions into relationship with the people for whom the demands of justice matter most. Part of Ricardo's motivation is to keep us engaged with the unfolding narrative of social justice and to avoid, to avoid the disempowering notion that nothing, nothing has changed. Ricardo sees social justice movements as waves, with each wave causing its own disruption. In another post, Ricardo reminds us we are now at the forefront forefront of a new powerful wave of resistance. There is much more that could be said, but let me instead simply welcome Ricardo as our keynote speaker today. Thank you. Is this working? Beautiful. Well, thank you, Tim, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you to the conference organizers, and thank you for the multiple pathways that have brought all of you into this room in a pivotal year in the declining era of an empire. Let me start out by um, asking you to give me a, uh, a little bit of help here. I'd like you to repeat after me. Thank you. In the struggle for justice, there's something for everyone to do. And while we don't all get the hang of it right away, somehow, if we all do it together, we seem to be able to muddle through, right? And we're going to be talking about unity today. Yesterday at Standing Rock, the domestic military um, forces of the empire moved against one of the encampments. And, <coughs> and these forces represent the accelerated merger of corporations and government that has been in process for 30 years. <coughs> At the same time yesterday, the Bundy gang, um, white racists who tried to stake their own claim to indigenous land, were let off the hook. Put those two things together, and we have racism as usual. 
right? That's what we're here today to talk about disrupting. And when we're talking about disrupting racism as usual, we need to be talking about far more than interrupting inappropriate jokes. We need to be talking about digging deep to the roots of a system that has been in place for 500 years and, as Arundhati Roy would say, deprive it of oxygen. The Standing Rock is one of the defining struggles of our time and will be a pivotal moment uh, for a generation in their understandings of struggle in the, the course of the history of the fossil fuel industry and the legitimacy of the governing powers and the governing parties and their lip service to climate responsibility. It's also a challenge to we who believe in justice to revive, to stretch those atrophied muscles of solidarity that have gotten very little exercise during 40 long years of nonprofit sedation. So along with the struggle on the plains, the Black Lives Movement in the streets and the youth-led immigration struggles in the borderlands have brought us full circle to the original founding crimes of the empire, which is now in its decline. I keep saying that. I'm not going to go into the story, but I want you to keep this in mind as you observe the world around you in the coming year. <coughs> so here's my challenge to you. That if you consider it to be your duty to spend your life fighting racism, oppression, and exploitation, I would like you to reconsider and to exchange that idea for the commitment to spend your life eradicating them. And that simple change of a world, of a word, sounds harmless enough, but it's as big as the world. That if we take Asada Shakur's requirement that we have a duty to win, and take that not as a cheerleading slogan, but actually as instructions, then everything changes. We have a completely different agenda, a different to-do list appears before us. Because fighting is something that we can do without planning, without thinking, without concern as to outcome. But winning requires taking ourselves back to school, learning about how the system works at its systemic, personal, and malignant carcinogenic levels. It means learning who is truly invested in a system of oppression and who are those who have simply been fooled, bribed, or frightened into its service. And when we do this, when I, well, first of all, I just want to say when I was thinking about disrupting racism as usual, disrupting the system, disrupting, and I was reminded of a... Um, uh, a piece by Frederick Douglass, the most influential blogger of the 19th century. <laughs> um, and he was um, railing against those who were all concerned, this was during the Civil War, a mere 15 decades ago, and he was all talking about those who were concerned about the, um, the dangers, the problems, the experiment that emancipation would represent, the disruption it would be to do something so untried. What are we going to do with all these people? Do, uh, what do we do with all these freed black folks? Are we going to export them to Africa? Are we going to give them full citizenship? My goodness. And Douglas said that it was a sign of the degra moral degradation of the country that the ownership of human beings by other human beings was considered the norm and freedom and generosity and compassion was considered the experiment. So let's flip the script and say that what we are doing is disrupting the disruption. That solidarity, sustainable relationships with nature, these are the norm. The disruption is this system of endless, endless, ruthless extraction, extraction of the land, extraction of the spirit that has been in place for some centuries. And that is the disruption that we need to simply set aside. So when we think about winning, we're thinking about not imposing something new, but simply removing the toxins, the, the toxins that keep us from what we, all, what we really know about the world. I was um, at a conference 
on soil restoration. I'm an artist, right? We, we need to know these things. Um, and a farmer from North Dakota, where they're doing some very cutting edge work around sustainable agriculture, was talking about what happened when she started going to her neighbors and talking to them about sustainable methods, about not tilling the soil, about overcropping at the end of the harvest season, about um, um, pasturing the animals outdoors during the winter instead of indoors. And what the farmers told her was, that really sounds good, but it's not possible. And what she chose to interpret that as was they were saying that is not possible given the current condition of the soil. Given the current condition of the soil. So she started thinking, well, what do we need to do to improve the soil to the point that these things become possible? And that's really been a useful insight for me because it's brave to me the concept of pre-organizing. When we talk about eradicating racism, overthrowing colonialism, and installing a humane uh, society, most of us will begin by thinking, that sounds really great. I'm willing to fight all my life, but winning, that's, not, that's impossible. That's crazy talk. So then our duty is to think, what is the pre-organizing? What are the conditions that need to be created? Because as Frederick Douglass would say, the society we are now living under is impossible. It's impossible. It's the theory that if you dump all of your junk into the pond and pull all of the water that you, you want out of it, without concern for the future, it's all going to work out. Can everybody say impossible? impossible. Right? So, <clears throat> so, so one of the things that happens when we make that shift in consciousness is that we start knowing what to do. We start knowing what to do. We start seeing the patterns. If you want to get through the mountains, if your dream is to cross the mountains and you don't believe it's possible, you won't even notice the pathways through them. So once we make that shift, once we cross that line, we start seeing the things that we couldn't see. We start seeing the vulnerabilities of the system that we're up against. Vulnerabilities. There are vulnerabilities. If you look at the things that the empire and the oppressive supporters of the empire are doing, where they put their resources, what they try to, pr to suppress, you will get a precise map of what they are afraid of you will get a precise map of their vulnerabilities. Look where they put their resources. Look at the mass prison systems. Look at the militarized police. Look at the suppression of Chicano studies and other forms of truth telling. Look at the defunding of arts education and you will know what they fear and, you'll, and we will know where our power is. And we'll also know how to think tactically. You know, if we want to win, we can't just call a boycott every time someone pisses us off. A boycott is a precise instrument of struggle made for certain conditions and not for others and requires groundwork, alliance building, and care. You know, simply expressing ourselves and venting is good enough if all we want to do is fight oppression. Not good enough if we want to win. So most of the activists alive today, most of the young activists have grown up under the unwritten agreement that I call a titanic compact. This was an arrangement that was installed at the end of the wave of struggle that's referred to as the 60s. And under the terms of the Titanic Compact, in, effe in effect, we get to fight for better conditions on the Titanic in exchange for not asking who owns the ship, where it's going, and how fast. We don't interfere. And the part of that bargain is that we get promised protection from st state violence and money directly from the 1% should make us suspicious. <coughs> so that's kept solidarity in the freezer for decades, since organizations can only spend their resources on their own narrow missions, can't reach out to each other, can't even see each other. Black Lives Matter and Standing Rock are a wake-up call to replace that with a revived politics of solidarity. And today we're going to be talking about unity. Unity and what it takes. It's not easy, but it's very satisfying and it's vital. I came here this morning with James Baldwin's voice in my ears. He said, if I love you, I need to tell you what you do not see. 
If I love you, I need to tell you what you do not see. We need to talk about what we do not see because that's what will sneak up on us. That's what will bite us. Even if it's comfortable not to see it, what don't we see? The most important thing that we don't see is each other. Ourselves and each other are the only instruments we have to change the world with. We need to take care of them. We need to understand them. We need to value them. We need to maintain them. We can't win without each other, and we can't be each other's true allies unless we believe that we can win. I'll explain how that works, but first we need to address what a, a matter of radical fragility. Yeah, you heard me right. Radical fragility. We have to talk about us. When I was a kid, capitalism was ha a half century younger than it is now. And people still fixed things, even in the capitalist market. Something broke and you repaired it. One of the greatest profit centers that the capitalist system has discovered is waste. To make things that break and that you can't fix. And you throw them away and it's cheaper to throw them away. And we have a world that's all about throwing things away. And it's a whole world that's all about throwing people away. And I think maybe you see where I'm going with this. Because... <clears throat> I promised myself I'd actually look at my notes this time. That's why I pause from time to time. Uh -huh. So we've become trained as we grow up to throw each other away at the slightest imperfection. And as long as we don't worry about winning, that's okay to do. Because what's the loss? We can always get another. It's not so good if we want to win. Nowadays, disagreeing with somebody's political ideas, especially in public, is a good way to end a friendship. When I was coming up into activism as a young person, it was a good way to start one. It was a good way to start one. We need to rediscover the joys of compassionate disagreement and a profound challenge. Mm. So there are a number of things specifically, you know, that we don't, we don't see so well. We're not very good. We can survive difficult discussions. We really can't survive without them. There are things, some of the things, the primary things that we don't see about ourselves is, first of all, the immense potential power in our hands. The other thing that we're not good about is honestly assessing our weaknesses. And the bad news is that our enemies are well aware of both. And yes, Virginia, there is an enemy. Hmm. <laughs> so we got a lot of work to do if we catch up and it's going to be messy and it's going to involve disagreement and it's going to involve being willing to be wrong and to buck the consensus there's nothing more dangerous in a movement for change than a, un a unanimous consensus we need to every movement that I've ever been exposed to has had an X factor that one thing that we didn't know at the time that came back to bite us and we only saw it in retrospect when Wounded Knee was occupied, the occupiers did not expect the militarized response that we're seeing now at Standing Rock. They did not respect that what started out as an issue of corruption and police violence on the res would turn into a national crisis. And the reason is that nobody knew that the Nixon administration had declared the Black Hills to be a national sacrifice area for re you know, reckless uranium and coal extraction. There's always something that we're missing. And so having those voices of criticism, those challenges to each other, is vital. <coughs> and when we give each other space to be wrong, that's the same thing as giving each other space to be creative. When I die, I just want my epitaph to read, he didn't always get it right, but at least he got it. So I was at the 4th Precinct occupation one night. You know, that was the response to the police murder of, jo of Jamar Clark. And I was standing there talking with a friend, and all of a sudden a chill went up my spine. You can see me cry a lot. I'm a crybaby. A chill went up my spine, and my head spun me around. They were chanting something behind me. They were chanting, I don't remember how it went, but it, included Jamar Clark, Jamar Clark, Jamar Clark. But what I was hearing 
with Mark Clark. Mark Clark, Mark Clark. Mark Clark was a young Black Panther leader in Illinois who was gunned down by the police in the raid that was targeting Fred Hampton. <clears throat> and they were coming after Chairman Fred. That was 4, 4 a.m. on December 4th, 1969. It was the day that turned me into a politicized youth, from a politicized youth into a revolutionary organizer, a path and I have not strayed from since. The math tells me that was 47 years ago, but I'm pretty sure it was this morning. Now, Fred was a young black man killed by the cops. That sounds familiar to me. He wasn't so young. He was 21. He was one of the older guys to my 13 years. But that's what put me onto the streets. And I wasn't just drawn to the Panthers because they were under attack. I want to tell you, well, I was drawn to them because they made sense to me. I grew up and come from the occupied island nation of Puerto Rico. Have you heard of it? The most in, one of the most important economic engines of the United States that most people don't know anything about other than that there are palm trees. Here we talk a lot about decolonizing ourselves, and I think that's powerful. That's a useful lens through which to work. But I would encourage you to remember that internal colonization is the poisonous child of flesh and blood, boots on the ground, colonialism. The armed robbery, the looting, the physical theft of land, people, power, and possibility. I don't think anyone in 40 years living in the Twin Cities has ever asked me what it means to grow up in a colony, to grow up in an occupied land, to be in your homeland and watch it dismantled before your eyes. And here I know on occupied land there are people in this room who know what I'm talking about. But I'm not here to scold you. I'm here to hold you. We have a lot to do. The day I see you marching for Puerto Rican freedom, I will not ask you, where the hell have you been? I'll say, welcome, we've been waiting. And that we need to be saying that to each other more and more as we show up for each other's struggles. So back to the Panthers. No, I want to tell you, I want to tell you about the Panther era, not because I'm some nostalgic baby boomer pining for the good old days, the glory days, because it wasn't like that, right? We were just as confused and clueless and brilliant as any young organizers today. Just a different time with different challenges. But what I want to do, I think there's a reason to, to go back there. Um, <clears throat> And that is to retrieve some pieces of knowledge that got left on the battlefield, that were left on the battlefield of that struggle before the smoke of Cointel Pro um, repression and the had, had cleared and the anesthesia of foundation funding had set in. I grew up in the Puerto Rican independence movement. One thing that happens when you are in, in an anti-colonial struggle, is that all the other anti-colonial struggles in the world become visible to you. You know about them. I knew about Mozambique and Palestine and Vietnam and La Dominicana and Cuba when I was 10 years old. These things, and the reason is that no, everyone knows you cannot defeat an empire by yourself. So we have to learn about each other. In fact, you can't know yourself unless you know others. How could we know the dynamics of our struggle if we didn't know what was unique about it to us and what was universal to all colonialism? What is unique about the anti-colonial struggle and what connects it to all other struggles for liberation? We cannot know ourselves if we only know ourselves. So when I came to the States, the Panthers were thinking that way. 
That made sense to me. At the very first press conference, they were talking about genocide against indigenous people and the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The very first time they spoke to the media and stepped out of the shadows. And <sighs> see, it's, um, TV people know this. If you end the sentence in and, it leaves the people hanging. <laughs> They'll wait for you next. So when, so when Chairman Fred and his crew organized Chicago, it was kind of the Birmingham of the North, one of the most segregated cities in the country at that time, under the banner of the Rainbow Coalition, they pulled in people from all these different movements, from the Puerto Rican Young Lords, from even the White Young Patriot Party. White Appalachian kids with Confederate flags on their jackets. They didn't ask, how can we mess these guys up? They asked, why are these people hurting? And they organized together against police brutality. And they organized together against housing. And they didn't do this in the way that the white liberals do it. They didn't do it by saying, we're going to meet them halfway. They said, our vision is big enough for you. Our vision is big enough for you. And when they went to them, they went to ask what's going on. They shot pool in their pool holes and they went to their parole healing hearings and they sat with them over beer and they listened to their stories, not so they could say yes, but, but just to say yes. Now I observed that process close enough that I can imagine with some confidence what they'd have done if someone had come to them and said, by the way, Native people are killed by cops in this country more than any other group, including you all. What might they have done? Well, I think the first thing they would have done is put a two-page two centerfold spread in their newspaper about it with sidebars about past instances of black Native cooperation in the struggle. They would have offered organizers to help any groups that wanted um, learn from their experience in, co in confronting the police state. They would not have said, step back, you're diluting our brand. Now the reason that they had the ability and the clarity to say that is because they believed in winning. When you are ma have made a commitment to actually achieve, to make a difference in people's lives, and not just express yourself and go out there and just fight, 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 then a lot of the, all the small differences become just that. They still might be important to argue over, you know, uh, to argue about over a cold beer, but they're secondary to that eyes on the prize, to, to that North Star. <clears throat> so I said earlier in the beginning that one of the things that we don't see is each other. <coughs> And that's historically rooted. The Southern black freedom in this country, whose impact is still being felt, the ground is still shaking from that movement, saw the world in black and white. In Indian country, they talk about native and non-native. In my own communities, we talk about Latino and Anglo, right? We each of us imagine ourselves in a world where we're on a stage and it's all just us and the white man. And all other people are simply bit players in our particular drama. But that's not the way history works. Talk about being internally colonized. Emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. The empire knows who we are, though. They know who we are. They study us. That's why they keep us confused and divided. That's all that stands between us and a better world is that we are kept confused and divided because they can attack Standing Rock. Why? Because similar level of protest is not happening at the same time in Atlanta and San Diego and Portland, Maine and, you know, Augusta, right? Keep us divide and on different, on different timelines. They didn't steal my homeland and sterilize 30% of Puerto Rican women because they got confused and thought we were indigenous. They didn't lynch native people in Chicanos because they thought that they were black. They didn't bomb the move house in Philadelphia because they thought they were Vietnamese. Racialized oppression was not born in Virginia in 1676 or even in the United States at all. It's not all about us. The Hmong here came here following their own trail of tears. The Somali wear the scars of their own robbed and manipulated homeland. 
Now, for sure, when people arrive, they're moving into the house that genocide and slavery built. But they're coming here with their own important contributions to the knowledge pool of resistance. Similarly, the oppressions of gender, ability, and age carry their own traumatic imprint and their own hard-earned wisdom to contribute. So we need actually not just to know about each other's stories and struggles and oppression, we need to study them. We need to study them. I never want to go to another conference where the native representative gets up and has to start by saying, by the way, Indian people still exist. I want the Vietnamese MC to say that. I want the black organizer to say that we need to be able to stand witness to each other's stories in the healing from trauma. One of the deepest wounds is re-traumatizing is to have your truth not believed, not listened to, to have people prepared to say yeah, but, yes, but, instead of simply yes. But if we're ready to win, then your story is no longer a threat to me. It, it, adds, it adds wind to my sails. Now, the black nationalism of the Panthers of my youth was different beast from the identity politics of today, mostly because it was utilized as a doorway into solidarity <coughs> rather than a substitute for it. And I say this with all affection. Identity politics is a necessary, a necessary stage in our liberation and our healing from trauma. It's where we discover our own voice, where we identify the lies that have held us down and we purge them from our systems. For most of us, it is the stage we must go to in order to metamorphose from the caterpillar stage into the butterfly stage of solidarity politics. We discover in identity politics that the, um, the oppressor is everywhere. Everywhere we look for him, and we attack him everywhere we find him. And that's often inside ourselves and each other. And that's good, but only at the transitional stage. It's not sustainable. Identity politics must move on to the stage of solidarity politics, or when it stagnates, it becomes and turns into so, um, identity instead of politics. Identity instead of politics. And there, in that place, it, is no th it poses no threat to the powers that be. The only th way it poses a threat is if it is a channel into a broader revolutionary consciousness of change. And I know too many activists, too many activists, you all know too many activists, who are hesitating right at that cusp, who have already waited too long at that boundary, undecided about the uncertainties and the risks of becoming butterflies. But I should say that when I came to the United States as a young immigrant and my family fell apart on impact and I dropped out of high school and I moved out at 15 and I ended up figuring out how to survive in the streets, what kept me from being really damaged by that trauma was that when I reached for self-medication there was real medicine in the form of social movements that were about liberation. They were about restoring power to people whose power had been taken away, and that's the definition of trauma treatment. So that that same helplessness that sends people, whether it's into Trump's arms or to get daddy's rifle and go shoot up their high school mates, in my time, there was an alternative. And that is what it means to make that transition because, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the struggle can be hard. Yes, but fighting without a North Star is even harder because the struggle, the traumatizing struggle for liberation, when you are, have a vision of it, when you let go of that imposed um, disease of despair, that toxin, when you get rid yourself of that, the struggle is not only joyful, but it is restorative. It is restorative. I have been in this movement since I was 13 years old, and I do not burn out. It's not because I don't feel the pain and the anger. It's because I do not do despair. If emotions are like our senses. They give us accurate and necessary information 
about the world around us so that we can survive. All organisms need accurate, nuanced information about the world around us. Anger, fear, pain, hope, love, give us that information. Despair is not an emotion. It's a, it's a dysfunction, a malfunction of the emotional immune system that robs us of our ability to get the information we need about our surroundings. So if you think about winning and you feel despair, you have some work to do because that takes you out of the struggle and we need you in the struggle. Do your work, get rid of it. Turn to the rest of us for help, but don't think that that reflects any interests other than those of the enemy. <clears throat> the political era that's called the 50s, the 60s rather, ended for me in July of 1976 in Philadelphia. That's where the, the protest march. We marched 60,000 strong under the banner of a bicentennial without colonies. Um, let me tell you, though, the, the one piece I need to tell you before I wrap up, before I go there. Is, if I, if I wrote the notes, I'll, otherwise I'll ad-lib it. I just want to tell you that the racist system that we are now um, confronting is built on three pillars of oppression. Three pillars of oppression, slavery, genocide, and colonialism. And those three pillars have been fused into an empire, but that fusion is confused, it's incomplete. And that is why we become so cute, uh, confused, thinking that your story is simply somewhere along the point of my story. That actually Fairbanks says, you believing that Indian people or other people of color are simply somewhere on the spectrum between white and black. These are all black. That is true under one system of, of oppression, but there are distinct ones that came together to form this system. So in Philadelphia, we marched under the banner of a bicentennial without colonies, 60,000 strong, and that was an organized by the Black Panther Party, the American Indian Movement, and the Puerto Rican Socialist Party the three pillars of the empire, well represented, and we marched to the deafening silence of a media that had gotten the memo that protest was no longer news. And after that, the smothering, the smothering power of the nonprofit Titanic Compact began to set in. Now the challenge of the 21st century will be the challenge of sustainable unity the challenge of sustainable unity. We've, we've figured out a lot, but that's where, they, that's where they can bring us down if we don't listen to each other, if we don't know each other's history in its details and its complexities, if we don't seek out the elders, not only our own, but each other's. And I just want to uh, you know, apologize to you young activists because I know it's awfully hard to find movement elders because there's such a proliferation of movement veterans. Those are the ones who are nostalgic for the glory days. The elders are the ones committed to the struggle who are willing to listen to you. Those are the ones you need to seek out. It's tough, but we do need each other because objects in mirror are nearer than they appear. <coughs> and powerful unity is never built around small ideas. It's never built around small ideas. You can't march down the street with a broad coalition demanding what do we want to be beaten up 5% less by the cops. Nobody ever put their life on the line to integrate a lunch counter. They put their lives on the line for a vision of freedom within which integrating a life counter was a tactic. So the strategy is always about building a vision that's large enough to hold us all. That's how the Panthers courted the, the young patriots. They didn't meet them that halfway. They didn't water down their message. They simply opened the door and said, come on in. And in the end, the Patriots were not only organizing with them, they would started their own Breakfast for Children program and free clinic and pop watch program modeled on the Panthers. They opened the door. Now, you'll notice that I haven't said very much really today about 
How do we reach out to white folks? How do we get those white folks to see the light and change their mind and become truly committed to the struggle? And that's because it's my belief that white solidarity follows in the wake of powerful, creative, compassionate, and effective movements led by people of color and indigenous people. That's what history has told me. In fact, not putting white folks in the center of our struggle against racism is the greatest gift that we darker people can give to our white friends. <laughs> it's the deepest education and the truest way to expose them to truths that are invisible under the, the stifling, um, oxygen-removing burdens of privilege. So there's a lot to talk about when we talk about empire, when we talk about winning. And all I touched on is one piece of that, and that's the restoration of solidarity, because that's the prerequisite. We need accurate information. We need all of our senses to understand our universe. I'm an artist. I know what perspective is. I have two eyes, so I can look at something and see it from two locations at the same time, and it gives me a truer picture. If we combine all of the eyes in this room, the eyes of people different from ourselves, the eyes of people in facing the enemy from different sides, then we will not just think that the elephant is a rope or a tree trunk. We will start understanding the nature of the beast, and we will start linking our arms around it which is another way of saying that if we build it, they will come. Thank you. Se puede, folks. Se puede.